we bring to you with heavy hearts some news that wasn't so great. A few weeks after the recording of our episode with Solomon Choi, which you guys are going to get to watch right after this short message, we found out of the passing of Solomon Choi. He leaves behind his beautiful kids and his lovely wife who gave us the ability to still be able to air this episode in honor of the incredible things he's done as an entrepreneur, building 16 handles, having an incredible family, and helping hundreds and thousands of people chase their lives into entrepreneurship. We hope this episode changes your lives just as much as it has impacted us. And we hope that you enjoy every moment that he could share with us. And we're super honored and super grateful that he got to spend some of his time empowering us and our listeners and viewers. So we hope you enjoy this episode just as much as we did. This episode is jam-packed with education, so it's dedicated to Solomon and his family. Please enjoy. Welcome back to another episode of Chew On This. Today, we have Solomon Choi who's joining us, and he was actually the founder of your favorite frozen yogurt place called 16 Handles. Today, Solomon invests in multiple brands. He runs Jabba Brands, which is a restaurant consulting firm, and has his hands in a bunch of other things, which I'm gonna have him go over shortly. But uh, Solomon, first of all, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come in and bless our audience here with uh, the knowledge you're about to drop. Uh, but for the few people who may not know what you've done and what you're working on now, give us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me. Um, really happy to be here. My name's Solomon Choi. I moved to New York City in 2008 uh, to, to launch 16 Handles, which was New York City's first self-serve frozen yogurt shop uh, in the East Village, actually celebrating turning 16 uh, in, in just a couple months here. So wow. uh, really interesting. That's there. awesome. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, came to uh, came to New York City, family, uh, Seed invested the, the, the first restaurant with uh, 600K. That's what I started with. Um, you know, grateful to say that uh, utilizing my background in franchise development, uh, we bootstrapped it. So, you know, outside of the first location, uh, never raised outside capital, That's insane. franchised it, um, got up to 41 locations, including three locations overseas. So certainly during a, you know, 14 year journey, uh, was able to not only you know develop the brand but uh, kind of go through all the ups and downs that come with entrepreneurship and building a brand um, but yeah i exited the company in august of 2022 uh, sold to my franchisee neil hirschman and youtuber danny duncan uh, they joined forces and said hey look you kind of built this brand got through the toughest parts of the pandemic but you're not reinvesting and looking to grow raise capital and so they're like you know let us take this thing national and I felt that that was the best thing to do for the brand and especially for my stakeholders who were my franchisees as well as again my family who were my investors um, so it was a great exit for the family um, and kind of like solidified that journey in you know moving to new york city during a tough time and if you look at the bookmarks right the, or the bookends it's like 2008 going right into the, <laughs> the 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 great recession and then really you know coming out of the pandemic but new york city still kind of going through the effects of certainly with the restaurant industry and so um, you know, certainly an incredible journey there uh, for myself just to be able to experience all of that. Of course. And then starting about seven years ago, I was introduced to kind of food and beverage CPG, was able to, you know, um, early stage invest and advise other startups. And what I've come to realize is that's what I love doing most mm -hmm. is I love working with entrepreneurs and I love kind of this idea of how do we have a go to market strategy and build a best in class brand that people are like, oh, my gosh, I can't imagine my life without this. That's right. And so I just think that that's like such a magical process. I want to do that over and over again. And so now with Java Brands, I you know consult for restaurants, but I also do advisory work for you know early stage restaurant tech, CPG, kind of anything within the food and beverage ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm passionate about. Again, I, I think there's some uh, people try to delineate. They're like, wait, so are you food and beverage CPG? Are you restaurant? <laughs> are you a tech guy? And I'm like, well, I guess kind of all of the above. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that how you get the consumer dictates now more than ever. You know how they want their food and beverage. Yep. You know, and I think the pandemic certainly shook the restaurant ecosystem, CPG. And you know, if you're a direct to consumer, you know, probably had a field day yeah, in 2020. Yeah. Um, but I feel like all of those behaviors still exist today. And I don't think we'll ever go back. So I think it's more about this idea of in addition to how are, you know, brands opening up their channels to be able to, again, meet the consumer where he or she is. And I think that's that's the name of the game now. Oh, that's super powerful. 
I think, um, I, I, you know, one of the pieces I, I think is fascinating is going back to the time when you started 16 Handles, right? Um, we, it still was a time where, you know, obviously there's ads and, 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 and Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, but it wasn't, you know, extremely well mature uh, to the point where it is today. Um, give us a little bit of sense of how you built community adoption of this concept. Um, cause I, I'm sure there's an element of like, I'm doing something that's different, which doesn't different doesn't always mean good. Right. Um, how, how did you kind of get through that first? I don't want to call it zero to one, but the zero to what it is today. What, what were those early stages like and how did how did you get people excited about what the heck 16 handles is? Yeah, I mean, great question. Um, certainly a lot more grassroots marketing efforts back then. Yeah, I'll never forget for the grand opening. I remember I would I went outside East Village. I was on Second Avenue and on St. Mark's and I was handing out flyers for uh, you know, just like yeah. the old, old, old promotion days for like the nightclubs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was handing out flyers and I remember I had a, uh, a grand prize. If you came in and made a purchase, like you got a raffle ticket. And I think the grand prize was like a, back then, like a, a 42 inch, like Samsung, like flat screen TV, which yeah. is, you know, was pretty cool, <laughs> pretty cool thing in, in early 2008. But um, yeah, man, like it was really just the evolution, I think, of everything from grassroots to being at the early stage of really social media, yep. you know, kind of a uh, web 2.0. Um, you know, I myself, I didn't even have, you know, a Facebook account or an Instagram. I mean, these things came kind of after for me and uh, because I wasn't social media native, you know, kind of giving away my age here. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I had to learn and it was really through my employees as well as the customers mm -hmm. that kind of helped me with that. You know, starting in East Village, that was a strategic move. That wasn't by accident. Um, I don't think anybody in my shoes would have chosen to open up three blocks within nine direct competitors, <laughs> right? I mean, certainly my, my real estate agent was like, kid, like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're not from New York, like save your parents money, don't do this. Yeah. You know, I was 27 years old and, you know, but what I thought was I said, hey, the New York City landscape, especially here in the city, I'm like, these guys are all paying market rent, which, you know, coming from LA, which is where I grew up and I also did business, I was like, I thought the rents were expensive there, mm -hmm. but in Manhattan, like price per square foot, like on a whole nother level oh, yeah. in its own ecosystem, but I thought, so within a three, four block radius, the fact that I would be store number 10, I literally just have to get the biggest slice of the pie. And so when I went into each one of my competitive, you know, competing, um, you know, brands or companies, I was like, I can do this. Like I, I have something that's unique and different. You know, I had the first mover advantage of bringing the self-serve pay by weight concept within Frozen Dessert. And, you know, Froyo was having its heyday. Like, you know, the Pinkberry, I, I give them a lot of credit. They mm. kind of did all a, a, the initial go to market mm. for, you know, putting Froyo on the so map. So was it Pinkberry, Red Mango and yeah. and then and then you or like yeah. around the yeah. same? Okay. Yeah. No, they were already there. So they were, you know, two of the nine direct competitors. Like wow. they were already established there just a couple blocks away from me. And. Um, I opened up directly across the street from a Tasty Delight. I didn't even know what that was. Again, coming from LA, I was like, I don't, I've never yeah. heard of this. Um, so there was a lot of that going on. Um, but yeah, I would say the grassroots. But in looking at that location, it was when I asked the real estate agent, I think the million dollar question, which was, or he asked me the million dollar question, I should say, because I was looking around through the city. I was like, I don't know the city. People aren't driving. That's right. I don't get it. Like they're telling me if I'm on the wrong side of the avenue that can make or break my business. I was like, how does that work when everyone's right. walking? And so. Uh, finally, I said, like, where are the freshman dorm? And the reason why this is important is because some people don't realize that like, I learned the frozen yogurt game in L.A. or actually in, in South Orange County in California uh, from the godfather himself, Mr. Song. Him and his wife have been operating America's Cup yogurt since 1990 when they bought the business. And they still today operate it as a mom and pop shop. Wow. Right. They put three kids through college, like just from this like one, uh, you know, one Froyo shop. And so I, I worked for him for three months for free just to learn the business. So in doing that, I, awesome. I knew who the customer was, right? I was like, it's like that 18 to 34 year old female, which then was like kind of that millennial female. And so coming to New York, when the real estate agent asked me, he's like, who's the customer? Who are you looking for? I was like, I want the 18 to 34 year old female. And that's when he's like, oh, well, NYU. Hmm. Then only to be confused again. Well, where's NYU? It's like, well, here's the thing. It's kind of campus. <laughs> and I, and the, so finally I said like, where are the freshman dorm? Cause that's gonna, you know, constantly bring me a new yeah. batch of customers every year, right? Yeah. I mean, in business, like how smart, awesome is that? Like your target smart. demo every year, like a new, <laughs> it's like not, not so a bad true. deal. Genius. So genius, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, and so that's when I realized, I was like, so even in a, such a competitive landscape there, you know, we had to outmaneuver each other to kind of get that new customer. Once we do, you got them for four years, right? So that's, that's not bad that's you know, before so they churn out if they move or, or something right. like that. But um, so that was really the strategy. And then again, I think social media, as I learned was the, you know, kind of primary form of communication and, we always refer to the customer as she at 16 handles because over 70 percent of our 
you know, social media followers, our loyalty program, um, you know, it's female. And so we would always be directing, you know, partnerships, product development, kind of all these things to her. What does she want? And mm -hmm. so it was always like, what is she consuming? How is she communicating? And I'll never forget, uh, we had Foursquare, which was also based in East Village at the time. The head of BD at Foursquare, I remember, gave me a call. This is back when, like, you know, call the office line at yeah. the store. <laughs> and I pick up and he's like, hey, um, this is Foursquare. Just want to congratulate you. You're one of the most checked in businesses on our platform. And I was like, dude, I'm not buying anything. I didn't even know what this was. I was like, <laughs> he goes, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not selling you anything. I was like, then why are you calling me? He goes, we want to send you free materials. Would you put like sticker or decals like on your window? And mm. I'm just like, wait, and then what? Right. Yeah. He's like, no, we promise you don't have to pay a thing. And I was like, okay, <laughs> so I'm make sure it's free. But it was really that. I mean, I think I kind of fell into that golden era of social media for, for, for businesses. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and just leaning into that, you know, I remember hiring, I mean, in 2008, 2009, to say you were a social media manager, I don't think that role even existed. I think mm -hmm. businesses were just scratching the surface and trying to figure it out, but leaning into it, because I knew, I was like, okay, something's going on here. Mm -hmm. This is definitely, uh, you know, reaching my target demo. And for them, th this is like their thing. This is yeah. how they're communicating. So I'm like, even though I'm one generation removed, I'm like, if I don't learn this and gravitate towards this, I'm gonna be left behind. And so I kind of doubled down again, being bootstrapped, I was like, all right, like we have to use this digital tool, right? I'm not taking ads out in the paper. I'm not kind of using, do, using traditional media because it's too expensive. And so I was like, this is a new way to communicate and leaned into it. Um, I think if you Google it, we'll still see like 16 Handles was the first brand to use Snapchat for like a, an ad campaign, mm -hmm. right? But again, we worked with Evan when he was like 22 years old, startup founder. And I hired a, a, a digital media guy and he's just like, hey, Snapchat, it's like a new up and coming thing. You want the young clientele? This is what they're using. And I was like, cool, come up with a promo and, and let's do it. And so I wasn't afraid to try. And I think it was really that attitude more than anything else. It was more, let's lean into what she <clears throat> wants, how she's communicating, mm -hmm. but then also let's not be afraid. Yeah. Um, Cause we're, it's literally first inning, like nobody knows yet. Right. And so like, well, why not be the, why not be the first ones to try? We won't always get it right, but if we try, then at least, right. you know, we'll kind of stay at that, uh, you know, at, at the front of the pack. That's right. Yeah. I think there, there's there's two things here, right? It's like being in business that long where it's like you see this new technology that's coming up, social media, but then also you kind of go through the ebbs and flows of like even the downsides of business, right? So 2008, then you go through COVID, right? What's your mentality and any advice to give any founders where they're kind of like, they're very zoomed in on, okay, I have this problem and like the, I, like the iOS update, right? For us, we thought that that was it. Like we were, okay, Facebook's not working anymore. There's no other platform that we can advertise on. Like we felt stuck, right? Um, any advice out there where, I mean, you've kind of gone through everything. So like any advice on how to just keep pushing forward and, and, and zooming out a little bit, you know? Yeah, no, great question. You know, like you said, I think the ebbs and flows of business, especially as it ties into uh, technology changes and I think there isn't as much of a shift in consumer behavior when it comes to, at the end of the day, like what is your brand delivering? Mm. Right? And I'm not talking about the physical product or service, but it's more of that, that positive emotional connection. To me, how do you 10x that? You know, um, it's not a feature set, it's not another SKU. Like those things are good and they can help. But to me, I, I don't think that that's ever evolved. Mm. Like to me, when I think about the brands that I liked when I was young, there was no digital, like, you know, it, it was, but it was very much how that brand made me feel, mm -hmm. right? And did they stay consistent and did they, did they grow with me as I grew? And I think if you focus on that first, then these other things become tools. Now, they could be tools that help you accelerate, you know, and outmaneuver your competition if you get in early. Um, but on the flip side, it also, I think, min minimizes and de-risks some of that uh, negative effect too, right? When it mm -hmm. works against you, like with the iOS update. But I think if you have that positive emotional connection, the guests, like the consumer, they'll also be more forgiving. Mm -hmm. You know, again, when you look at it in the, in the in the long run, when you look at it through a macro lens, that's what I think. Look, Froyo as well. Like after 2013, like it, these these cyclical waves, and again, being in food specifically and being in desserts, dude, it's these three to five year waves, right? And so like you have these ups and downs. Consider this: when I opened up that first location in East Village, that store used to be a Cold Stone Creamery. Mm -hmm. So this was at a time where again, kind of that like shift that shift of kind of ice cream 1.0 was kind of losing relevancy and then mm -hmm. Froyo came in, right? And then guess what happened? You had the likes of the Van Lewins and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Morgan Stern's like some of these other ice cream, you know. So to me, like, we'll, we'll continue kind of going down this path. I don't think that'll ever change. But one of the things I remember, I started franchising in 2010. 
And the early franchisees, they were just like, you know, well, back then you opened up a Froyo shop, like you were making money, even if you didn't know what you were doing, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? But I remember like, they'd be like, hey, is Froyo a fad? Is frozen yogurt a fad? And I said, absolutely it is. And they're like, well, so is my investment protected? And I was like, well, that's to be determined. I have to prove that out to you. But at the same time, I was like, I'm not doing this to ride this Froyo wave because it's, it's right now, but it's probably gonna end soon. Right. And, and, and I think like they were taken aback by that. Right. Because they're like, you would think that someone's selling a franchise and our franchise agreements are 10 years long. Right. They're not going to be like, oh, this is a fad. It's like, no, no, no. Like this thing's here to stay. But I was like, no, it's a fad. Yeah. But if you're getting in something, get in when the fad is hot. Right. You know, let That's the right. wind come, you know, push, push your sail as opposed to going, you know, rowing against it. But but what I said is if, if, if I do what I'm saying I'm going to do, which is I'm going to build a lasting brand. You know, I want to be in the likes of, you know, with, with the names, with the likes of the Carvels of the world or Baskin Robbins. And, you know, mind you, that's where I got the inspiration. I grew up in Southern California. It was 31 flavors Baskin Robbins, mm -hmm. right? And it wasn't like the BR, it was where the 31 is like hidden. It was like 31, the old school 31 <laughs> font. That's what it was about. So I wanted to own a number. And that's why, you know, I did 16 handles. But, you know, I, I, I thought about that. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of similarities there, which was that guest experience about coming in. There's a lot. So it's like a wow factor, right? Kid in a candy store, literally. Right. And then it was like the flavor development. It was the fact that you can get free samples. And so I took a lot of that from my experience of what that magic moment was for, for, from, yeah, for myself and just kind of packaged it in a different way with kind of a, a trending form factor in soft serve, um, which I loved. So I will say this, though, what I loved about it that I thought maybe not exactly a moat, but more so than scoopable ice cream is you, most people don't have a soft serve machine in their home or their office. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you know, being here in the Northeast, like sure, in the summer months, you might have a Mr. Softy truck or whatnot. But again, one or two flavors, you go to McDonald's, if you're lucky and their soft serve machines working, right, that's become a meme on, meme on its own. Again, one flavor. So I was like, if we can have the most flavors and they can customize like that in itself. And it works. Yeah, and it works, right? <laughs> and if one doesn't, I mean, we got seven other machines as backup. So, you know, we'll always have some that work. But, um, you know, I thought that that was an interesting play. Uh, because again, like I don't, I never thought like, oh, you know what, Froyo or soft serve is going to overtake ice cream just because i think when you when it comes to accessibility There's scoopable ice cream, cream yeah it doesn't get easier than that yeah um and then when we started getting into delivery because we were also on the delivery platforms in 2010 so i think these are some of the things where again mm. being early on into it mm -hmm. why right um come 2020 like I, a lot of my competitors were scrambling right because their stores were closed especially here in the northeast like we can't see customers so unless you do delivery or pickup you don't have a business and mind you, I already had at that point a decade of being on all the third party platforms. I mean, we were doing delivery before Uber Eats, DoorDash, Caviar. Like, it's kind of crazy if you wow. think about it. Wow. But why? Right. It wasn't because I'm so smart. Um, you know, it was because, again, like I remember by the second winter. Right. So by the winter of 2009, I remember like I was still in the East Village location. And during the winter, getting a phone call or phone calls, I should say. And people are like, oh, do you deliver? First winter, I'd be like, no, like we're self-serve. You come in for the experience, you make it yourself. Like that's the whole point of the experience. Like we don't deliver. Right. By the second winter, also now the sales aren't as high as they were for that, for that first year hype. I'm like, okay, I'm sitting here. It's snowing outside. I don't have a line out the door. And meanwhile, people are calling me and saying, I want to give you money if you'll bring me your product. And I'm like, no, we don't do that. I'm like, all right, I'm not going another winter without this. And that's why by 2010, I was like, we got to figure this out. So operationally, logistically, packaging, all of that, like we had to figure it out, but we did. And so then the third party platforms just became what? Channel extensions. Mm. It opened up, right? And so I, I, that I was very early on. And it was really about that. It was, I'm gonna keep saying yes to the customer as much as I can. And if, yeah. if, if we as a brand are committed to that, then she's gonna reward us by staying loyal to us, right? If that answer was no, because you know what? My brand is all about that in-store self-serve experience only, and again, like you could respect someone that's like, you know what? I don't wanna, I don't wanna you know, offer anything more than that. Yeah. But for me, it was always about, you know what, we're malleable, you know, and if and if our business is about customization and personalization, then I feel like you can't really put such restrictive borders around that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that lens opened up, again, a lot of opportunities, both through, you know, uh, channel extensions being really omni channel at that point as a self serve frozen yogurt shop. I mean, both in form factor, who would think like, wait, you deliver soft serve and imagine the summers. Imagine trying to convert a customer where it's like, hey, you know, soft serve, the one that melts even faster. We can <laughs> deliver that to you. Right. Like that was an uphill battle. Again, thankfully, the third party delivery providers like incentivize people to try. Um, but then come winter, it was a godsend because rather than trying to tell people, hey, we know it's come snowing outside. Out. Put on your boots and your jackets yeah. and then come in and eat something cold. It was like, hey, you have the convenience where we can open this up. 
And I'll tell you that I, I really saw the benefit of that during um, uh, kind of the streaming wars, right? And so this idea of even like Netflix and chill, I was like, oh man, chill, chill with some bro, right? And I was like, right. that lends itself That's nicely. Right. But I would see that we had a cyclical business being in the Northeast and obviously our spring and summer months, we crush, right? Because we don't really have to do much marketing. People want things that are cold. Come fall, we see the drop off. Mm. But with fall programming, especially with like TV and streaming, we saw that as our opportunity to create mm. relevance and now open up that channel and really focus more on exactly. emphasizing the channel, right? Which we can do through product as opposed to just, hey, come into our stores. Right. And so being able to kind of unlock the business's strengths, we're like, hey, we're pretty malleable, right? And, and that early discovery, I think, gave us a competitive edge when I didn't see any of my competitors doing that and like kind of leaning into that. So again, it wasn't just about, oh, our tart tastes better than Pinkberry's tart. Like, mm. I'm like, if we're gonna compete at that level, like that's, that's a very short lived battle. And yeah. at, at some point people are gonna be like, you know what, we don't even like tart, yeah. you know? And so like, that's why I was like, you know, let's not do that. The other yeah. thing that one of my competitors, I think made a, a fatal flaw was they focused on health, right? Because again, I, I will say that obviously in 2008, you know, that whole movement also, yeah. which I think came from really the digitization and the accessibility of information. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Right now, it wasn't just, hey, whatever this box or package says, like, I trust that to be true. If mm -hmm. I don't know what this ingredient is, oh, well. Yeah. You know, it was very much about discovery. And and I even saw the shift in grocery. And so this is probably where my kind of instincts towards CPG came in, where I'm like, hey, you go to some of these stores and now there's like gluten free aisle. You know, <laughs> this thing, which I started with, I always offered a non dairy flavor but it's not just for lactose intolerance. There's this shift where people are, don't wanna maybe consume like animal byproducts. Mm -hmm. Or again, when I saw the real boom of plant-based and mm -hmm. I'd go to the, the food shows for that, I was like, okay, we gotta get in on that. Mm -hmm. And so again, I think it was always just this unrelenting desire to wanna to understand her that allowed us to win. Like when people ask like, yo, how did you beat Pink Bear, man? You're bootstrapped, like they, they raised tens of millions of dollars and you didn't. And, and honestly, I think the, the biggest thing that I'll say is I said, I think I had and led with customer obsession more than any of the uh, any of my competitors. Mm -hmm. I think I can definitively say that because I never saw them at any of the food shows. I never saw them at these omni-channel marketing conferences where they're like, wait, you're a Froyo chef in New York? Like, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. To me, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn how to do business. I'm trying to learn how to connect to her. And yes, we're in the food and beverage category, but why do I have to be limited to restaurant right. shows or franchise right. shows? Mm -hmm. I mean, those are given, those are table stakes. But to me, when I started going to like the Expo East and West and the fancy food shows and where buyers from like Whole Foods and Kroger's would go, I'm like, that is information at scale. That is trend at scale. Yeah. Not just my restaurant versus yours. And so again, like I think these eating and drinking occasions are, are simply that, they're occasions. How we deliver that to them, fit, you know, figuratively and literally, I think is, that's up to the brand to figure out. And mm. I think, again, we were always at the forefront of like, we gotta figure this out. There has to be a way to do this. Um, and I think then the natural progression there is like, over the years we did these like uh, collaborations and partnerships and those were awesome. Um, again, I, I wanted to leverage, I'm like, we're in New York City. That has to stand for something. I yeah. took a huge risk and a gamble coming here. But even that, like, they're like, why would you leave LA, Southern California, where it's warm all year round, yeah. right? To come here where it's seasonal, it's competitive, it's expensive. And I thought, you know, there was one reason, one reason only, you know, as somebody who studied marketing and branding and advertising, um, you know, in school, I was like, the number one consumer market is New York City, right? And That's you could period. argue like LA is, yeah. is no small, you know, no small, is, isn't chump change, but it's not New York City. And right. New York City has global eyeballs, yeah. right? And so to me, I'm like, that's all I need to know. And thank goodness I wasn't a finance major. Cause you know, if I studied yeah, anything yeah. in 2008, like that was the craziest thing. And looking back, I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. right? Like, you know, if I had a, if I had an entrepreneur now who I was advising and they're like, hey, I wanna, you know, go into a market like New York City, like heading into a reset, I'd be like, Dude, don't do that, yeah. go anywhere else, right? Um, yeah. But I also think, you know, sometimes it's that, it's doubling down when others are retreating, Yeah. right? Though, I mean, that's how hedge funds win, that's, you know. I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, so I think, you know, all of those things combined, but it, it was really, again, I think, uh, customer obsession and this desire to really create that emotional connection with her, Yeah. right? Because people are like, oh, you did Oatly, you know, you did, yeah, those are tactics, but those all lean into what? They all go back to the main thing, which is that's her. Right. That's her diet, that's her the, ev the yeah. evolution and the transition of her trying different things to trying different diet. So we need to be there for her. And if we are and we continue to do that, yes, some of these collabs or some of these flavor launches may not hit, you know, mm -hmm. but she'll know we're, we're constantly trying. Yeah. You know, some of the social media platforms, I remember being early on to things like Kick and some of these others, and they were busts. <laughs> 
But guess what? Oh my God, we, but cake. we got Snapchat, <laughs> yeah. right? Guess what? We got some. So if you didn't me, try them all, you if you didn't know. exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think you know this idea of like, well, we have to get it right. The, the thing you have to get right is just like, is it is the customer going to appreciate it long, you know, in the, in the long run? And if you do, then guess what? They're also going to forgive you and give you grace when you get it wrong sometimes, you know. But I think if you're so honed into trying to get it right. And, and then you get that one shot and they see you do it and you get it wrong. Like, I think the stakes are yeah. too high for that. You, right. may, you, know, that, you may, you know, go past the point of no return at that point. So. Right. No, I think there's such an important lesson in, in, in what you just talked about, which I think actually directly correlates to CPG D2C brands today, uh, which is costs are going up to acquire a customer. Right. And then you see this like sudden scramble for a lot of brands like, oh, well, I'm focusing on retention now. And it's like, well, yeah, you can go focus on retention now, but if you don't, if you weren't doing it all along, right. they're gonna know that you're focusing now <laughs> because you have to, right? Mm -hmm. And and you know, you can go and like scramble up a loyalty program or you know start to build a community, you know, because you have to now because cost to acquire is is, is, is so high. Um, but if you don't naturally when you start a brand or, 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 or even have or build the ethos of a brand, if it's not naturally there where you're going to be obsessed with your customer. Um, it's not that you can't build a brand. I mean, direct response brands do great, right? I don't care about the customer. Um, but you can't shift randomly to go and do it because it, it won't come with the right uh, purpose and the right um, foundation of, of what it takes. For us, you know, we've, we've been doubling down on building our community for Obvi, which is now almost 100,000 women on a Facebook group. And we're totally hear what you're saying, which is like, even every product we've released, it's what does she want, right? Uh, or, or if you have to change a product, what flavor adjustments do we need to make? You know, everything is survey based, feedback based. What else does she have in her cabinet? What else can we make so we can replace that item in her cabinet from to an Obvi product, right? So it's like totally can align with you on it. But um, I, I'd be awesome to, to, to also take a sense of like, if, if fast forward, you're 27 years old, um, but it's 2024, okay? I know you kind of hinted at like, well, I, I'm probably not gonna start in New York, but um, what is what is building 16 handles today look like? And, 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 and maybe some of the things that you've been seeing or some of the, some of the inspiration you've been seeing, where would you start? Is there, is there elements to how you'd approach, whether it's 16 handles or just uh, another business um, in that category, what, what would it look like? So first I'll say this, is I think that there is an advantage of having kind of that more um, daring approach of like, I can only win, there is no downside. Doing that now in my, in my 40s with a family, you know, my risk tolerance is not that 27 year old. Right. And I'll say this, and, and I've said this before, but I'm like, even now with the wealth of knowledge that I've built, not just with 16 handles, but other brands I've been able to invest in and see grow, I can't beat that 27 year old there was no turning back. It was a burning of the sales moment. Like it was a one way ticket from LA to New York and two suitcases and that was it, you know? And just knowing that I can still kind of put myself in, in, in his position, but it was very much this relentless desire to win. And winning was that, it was like to be best in class, like to be number one and to know that there's, you know, so much adversity that should rule you out. And I think Embracing that, I think, and having that fearless approach is can be a good thing, right? If, if directed well and uh, and having a good team around you to, to to be able to execute on that. So first, I'll, I'll start with that. I think that doesn't go away. Mm. Look, I I, uh, I actually am an investor and a co-founder in New Bakery um, that uh, one of my clients started and asked me to come in as a co-founder. Um, and so we opened it together. It's called Someday's Bakery. Just had a grand opening in in Astoria, Congratulations. Queens. Congratulations! Um, it is on fire. Like it is doing well. And part of it, I mean, there's a surprise element to that because, A, I didn't put in the blood, sweat and tears into doing this like I did with 16. And so, you know, part of this is there is more um, there's more thought put into this, I would say, from doing research, from understanding kind of like, you know, competitive landscape and, um, you know, where there's an opportunity, you know, kind of like evergreen area. So in looking at it through that lens, like what's the TAM and what kind of revenue can we do it? You know, it's more formulaic yeah. mm. and there's nothing wrong with that. But again, that versus the, hey, 27 year old me, that's like, I'm gonna open up right next to you and I'm just gonna outgun you. <laughs> that, those guys are scary, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, so to me, I think like, if you're not willing to go all in, yeah. then I don't think you really have a shot, right? Because there's gonna be people now where like, I have more capital, more expertise um, and more experience now but I will still have an element of fear if someone's willing to just go all in 
Yeah. Um, you know, so there is some of that. You know, the other thing I'll say is, again, like while there are, um, you know, some external challenges, to me, I think because I started when I did, I had a lot of external challenges, right? Like that 2008 was not when you came to New York City to start some retail concept when, when like the finance industry was like, you know, going up in flames. And um, but in looking back, I think like, well, what were some of the advantages that were there where others would be like, hey, you know, cup is half half empty. And I'm like, wait, no, but it's, it's also half full. Right. So I think it's finding those half full moments. So for me in 2008, it was I had overqualified staff. Right. And so, I mean, I miss it. But back then, I think minimum wage was like eight bucks an hour. And I remember getting interns who were there for like fashion and finance, again, kind of from all, all over the country. I remember I had an Ivy Leaguer. I won't say his name, but I don't remember it. But he was from <laughs> Yale, right? And he was there for yeah. a summer. So he was getting like an unpaid finance internship because it was tough to get a finance. In, but, so he, but he needed, you know, he was like sharing a room with like, you know, three other roommates and he needed extra cash and flexible hours. And that's what we offered. And so he came. I had another uh, young lady. She was awesome. She was working um, uh, at, at one of the uh, big fashion brands. And same thing, like she just needed extra money. So I looked at that and I'm like, these people would never apply to work as a counter serve you know, person at a Froyo shop. Yeah. But because of the, you know, the economic Super landscape and the yeah. hardships, they, they needed it. They, they needed advantage. it. Against it. Yeah. So, so to me, like, I'm like, well, I've overqualified staff, which was awesome. Right. Um, the other thing was, again, it wasn't as competitive because um, there weren't a lot of people looking for retail spaces at the time. Right. So there was more negotiating with the with the landlord. So, you know, in, in looking at those things again, like what someone would may, maybe argue and say it's so difficult you got to find those moments and be like, well, how do you turn that into a strength? And then That's how do you right. weaponize that? That's right. right. And I think it's those opportunities and those entrepreneurs who can find those opportunities that are going to outmaneuver. Right. I, I give this example because um, I actually met the partner at Maverin, um, you know, which is uh, Howard Schultz's VC, Howard mm -hmm. Schultz, founder, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, of, uh, and, and, and chairman of, of Starbucks. But his partner, they were hosting a, a happy hour and I went right. And I went now as an investor and got invited to the happy hour and I went up to him and I introduced myself. And he's like, gave me, he gave me a firm hatching. He said, congrats, you had a way better exit than we did with Pinkberry, right? <laughs> so just to put into perspective, they led Pinkberry's Series A round of $27.5 million wow. um, four months before I came to New York City and signed a lease. I knew about it. And yet I still went and opened up a store which was around the corner from one of their stores, right? So that's again, wild. like if you look at that, and if I were to look at it through, through this lens now, I wouldn't do that today. I'm yeah. like, that's crazy. <laughs> but that's the whole thing. When everyone was saying that's crazy, I realized, but you're not me and you don't have this conviction. And, um, you know, while there is some luck that needs to be involved, I put in my dues, right? They don't know that I worked for free for three months to learn this business inside and out, right? In a store, like yeah. that sort of sacrifice and the preparation um, you know, that can't get, that can't go overlooked. So yeah. what I will say is also this is I, you know, I always um, encourage, uh, you know, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, you know, people <laughs> who want to start a company, put in those dues. Yeah. Right. It goes a long way. And again, use your youth as your advantage to weaponize against older people like me and older. Right. right? Where we're going to be looking at charts and pro formas and, you know, use our experience to kind of like, you know, Unfortunately, you can, or, or you can you can use the cloud of, hey, I'm young and hungry and I'm willing to put in the work and to learn and to be a sponge. I think that goes, you know, I think that goes so far. Um, so then it's less about, well, you know, for focusing on, you know, CAC or LTV. It's like, yes, those things are required and you should know those things, but that's you can't you, you don't have a competitive advantage there. Right. Mm -hmm. Just because, again, whether it's uh, iOS or meta or anybody else like there's going to be gatekeepers that kind of control and limit right especially right. when you're talking about digital or d2c so then it becomes okay as far as the storytelling and how i'm going to connect with the customer you know we look at it now and you know we see influencer marketing right but i i genuinely believe that you know with gen z and then with my kids in alpha generation they can see right through disingenuous and paid partnerships oh, yeah. oh my God. and they really frown upon that now yeah. right like Big time. the old guys that i deal with in the restaurant industry they're just they're still in the uh, they're still do, looking at it through the lens of like you know five ten years ago where it's like oh if we can get a celebrity to promote our yeah. product it's like it's got to be the right one and it's got to make sense right right and the best way to do it is to get that um you know, to get a celebrity to give you UGC, right? Where it's just like, they love it. And, and those are gold. 100%. So then to me, that's how I would look at it. How do you build it in a way? Because guess what? Celebrities are people too. Actors are people too. Yep. Athletes are people too, yep. right? And the thing is, there's a way to be able to connect to them on that human level. Mm -hmm. And if they're in your target demo, build something that they'll love, you know? And, and I've seen that and you, you've seen it. We've all seen it. Yep. And those endorsements, literally then flip all these other things that are handicaps and put them out the door where it's like, yeah. mm -hmm. 
so-and-so posted about this thing, whatever, like we didn't pay them to be a brand ambassador, but that's what a true brand ambassador is, right? Somebody that's like, hey, you, I'm not getting anything other than this product that I paid my money that's for. Right. And that can, you know, that can shoot your, you know, that can give you a different trajectory. And so, you know, to me, it's like focus on the things you have control over, um, but don't let go of that unrelenting desire to, again, like have that customer obsession and the tools are tools, but if it's the same tools everyone has access to, then those aren't competitive advantage tools. Right. So what is that competitive advantage? And I think searching for that and really understanding that. Um, and for me, again, it took a few years for me to understand like what that was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know in, <clears throat> from day one, it's like, oh, it's customer obsession. I didn't know that. <laughs> right. But right. when I found myself, it's like, you know, my team would be like, dude, why do you travel so much? You go to like eight to 10 shows a year. And, and even some of my franchisees, they started criticizing when Froyo sales started getting soft. And they're like, shouldn't you be, you know, and I'm like, I'm going and learning like this is my MBA and it right. doesn't end in two or three years. It's ongoing. It'll mm -hmm. never end. Why? Because the customer journey and trying to make improvements like that's a that's like a that's like an artisan craftsmanship type of a thing, right? Like you're just trying to get a little bit better every right, every single right. time and to stay sharp. The answers are out there. They're not in my office. That's right. Right. And so, um, again, I, I think those qualities in the grand scheme of things will outweigh whatever new tool you can get. But at the same time, also don't overlook the tools. If you can get right. in those early, right, right before right. they get expensive, like I'll never forget the days. I'm like, wow, I remember on Facebook when we had 200 followers and we would post, hey, we have this new flavor coming out. All 200 people would get that information. Yeah. <laughs> now I got to pay for a percentage of them yeah, to see yeah. that information and hopefully they convert. And so, yeah, it's a different day and age so for true. sure. It reminds me of our story a little bit because like when we started Avi, <laughs> this is when Vital was just getting bought out. They just got That's Jennifer like, yep. Aniston. And it was like, why are we even doing this? Like, why are we going up against this, right? And I think to your point, it was, well, we did have that experience of from what, 2014 up until 2019 of really building brands and seeing how the lens of marketing has changed, right? From, from going from, you can post on Instagram and all million followers would see it to, okay, now I gotta spend money on Facebook, mm -hmm. I can, uh, I could spend a dollar and make 10 and we saw that turn, I could spend a dollar and make three yeah. and then we saw it turn into, I gotta spend one and make one, right? I think our whole thing, and especially now when we go and talk to even some of these retailers, it's like, well, why should you be on the shelf, yeah. right? Um, I think when we answer that question is, yeah, you could go get a, a collagen that's cheaper. You can go on Amazon and buy it. You can go to Walmart and pick up something cheaper. Um, but what you're really buying into is the community. Right. Um, when somebody, you know, asks, it's like, oh, yeah, like uh, you have 100,000 people in that community. Like that's massive. And there are, there are other brands that are way bigger than us starting communities because we started one. Right. right? Um, and, and, and to your point is not using that community in in the wrong way as well. Right. It's like I have people ask me, well, how do you track sales from the community? And it's like we don't because it's not a sales channel. Right, it's it's a channel where we learn about the cons the consumer, um, we communicate with the consumer. Uh, like people know who we are, and we know who some of these community members are. Um, like we'll go live in there, we'll talk, and 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 you know if there's problems with the product, we want to fix it. Right, so I think customer obsession always um, is number one, and then leveraging all the tools that come after it. Right, so TikTok shop, you know, it's like we've been trying so hard to figure that mm -hmm. out. Um, it won't stop until we do. Mm -hmm. And then there's probably gonna be the next thing that comes out and the next thing, right? So um, it's it's very inspiring to see how from 08 till now, you've literally saw everything come into the market. You're like, let's do it, right? Let's test it, whatever happens, happens. Um, but I think brands should, the, the message they should take away from this is, put your ego aside, right? Um, don't feel like you can't get into something because it's like, oh, it doesn't really resonate with the brand, right? There, there are brands out there who have got funding and they, they have no control anymore, right? And I'm sure they wish that they can go back and be like, you know, well, I want to try this. I want to go in this direction. So mm -hmm. um, I think what you've said is like super inspiring and uh, really like anybody who's listening to this, like oh, no, take that advice and, and run with it. And the coolest part is, is it's coming from a territory that we're not always talking about, which is we're not talking about retail shops or, you know, restaurants or a frozen yogurt shops. Right. But the, the, the fact that the theory of how that was ran and how you obsessed over that one element, that importance of that in like today's D to C world, it is like it, it is the first thing. I mean, yesterday, too, we were at a founder's event. 
every single person just talking about like, yeah, just trying to get to know my customers better, <laughs> trying to, you know, uh, understand what they want, trying to build it this way. And it's like, it is, um, again, you, you were 16 years ahead of where now it's, it's a requirement. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it's table stakes now um, to where it was really a luxury to even be able to think about it. So uh, kudos to you. Incredible. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, something else that I'll <laughs> mention now is, again, this idea of, you know, it's an overused terminology that we've all heard of, which is omni-channel. Uh, but I actually think that, uh, you know, having that obsession across every channel right. and refining that is an ongoing process. It's a never-ending process, right? Because these channels will shift, they'll evolve, they'll change, new ones will come in. And to me, the answer is like when people would ask, they'd be like, oh, so what, do you, what is your thought on this? Like, what do you think about this? I'm like, yeah, you should try it. Yeah. You know, and but then it be, and then they'll be like, yeah, but then don't you lose focus? I was like, no, the focus, the focus should never change, which is what it's the customer. Mm -hmm. So if all these are interesting channels for the customer, then why wouldn't you want to activate all of them? But we have a limited budget. I get that, but that's where you got to be resourceful. Yeah. Right. And again, if I'm telling you this, and I never raised a dollar of outside capital, like who, are, you know, <laughs> if you've raised investors' dollars, like, you know, it, it's interesting now because now I'm on the other side where I'm also, you know, investing into brands. Right. And yeah. I hold my founders accountable. I hold them accountable because I always remind them and they don't like it when I push back with this. But I do. I'm like, imagine if I had someone like me helping me, you know, when, when, mm -hmm. when I needed them. And then they're also like, you know, helping me raise capital and saying, like, hey, you can do these things. Hey, there's this, um, you know, I wanted to vertically integrate and have my own manufacturing. I thought about that. And people are like, well, why don't you do that? I'm like, because that's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> you can't bootstrap a factory. You need millions of dollars, right? Like, you know, the, 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 the greatest story there was Hamdi who did Chobani, but even him, like he took like a million dollar loan and he did that and yeah. he did more than 10 exit. But, you know, but my point is like it starts with, and so, and I was like, and that's out of my wheelhouse. I want to stay close to the customer. Once I go into manufacturing, now I'm really in the operation side of things. Yeah. And so to me, I'm like, no, I'm going to stay right here and do this. But yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, customer obsession, yeah. having access to all the channels, staying committed to that process, and then something good will come out of it. You know, yeah. when someone was like, oh, well, why did you decide to sell? I didn't decide to sell. The opportunity to sell came to me, mm -hmm. and I really felt that it was a passing of a torch when Neil came to me. He was 27 years old, right? And he had bought That's my cool. three Manhattan locations, including the original East Village store. So I was like, this isn't private equity, it's not family. I said, not to say that those aren't bad exits, that's fine. But to me, I wasn't in a sell mentality. I was yeah, very much, yeah. I was actually trying to rebrand and double down. Cause I'm like, wait, my, my, my competitors are smoked. Like they didn't have, and I think he saw that, but he was also like, hey, like I wanted to go think, I want to do things differently and I want to actually put capital in and I have an unfair advantage. Cause I have somebody who did, you know, like a hundred million dollars in, in, in revenue, like, you know, with their, with their brand. And I was like, okay, you have an advantage that I don't. And guess what? I'm also like further removed because you are the customer base, you're the demographic of the mm -hmm. customer, as well as your partner that's coming in, I'm not, mm -hmm. right? And while I can continue to try to, to stay, you know, my, my thing is why don't I give it to someone who's already invested their time, their yeah. energy, their money, right. right? And to me, like I would love for you to then get to where I'm at, where it's like 15 years later, you know, yeah. you pass it off to them. So I, I felt that it was more of like this completion of this entrepreneurial journey where like my end becomes kind of his real start. Wow. Yeah. And that was, that's priceless. That's so cool. You know, not to mention like the multiple I got because of that scenario was way better than if I of were course, trying to sell course, it. You know? yeah, so, yeah. you know, build it in a way where it becomes so attractive, where then you have that, that, that opportunity. You have all the leverage then. That's right. right. And I think, you know, especially in today's landscape, money's expensive and it's tough to raise capital. It, so yeah. uh, again, from the lens of an investor to now also um, with Jabba Brands being a consultant and, and, and working in that realm, what are some of your favorite brands out there right now? Who are, who are, who are the ones that are obsessing over customers um, and, and some that you've just seen do some special things um, in the landscape? Yeah, so I'll say within food, um, Dave's Hot Chicken, they're one of the fastest growing brands and I've gotten to know the leadership team well. Um, I, I just had actually had a Zoom call with the, um, with the CFO who is very into tech and data and he showed me like, the behind the scenes kind of of what they're using. And I was like, wow, like you talk about guest obsession from data to service to the overall experience really? to product. I mean, it transcends through leadership and guess what? And, and the leadership, they're also franchisees. Mm -hmm. I don't see brands that big where leadership are also on the other end of that. Right. Oh, and so to yeah. me, I completely respect that. And it shows like to me, like the proof is there. They put skin in the game. They've yeah. doubled down on the brand, even with their own you know, efforts and capital. Dave and so so yeah, so I mean, big props to Dave's. I think they're doing an amazing job and, and their growth is a, is a testament of that. I don't yeah. think, again, like 
Same thing with Chick-fil-A, right? Again, I know it's the topic of chicken, but chicken has been the hottest like protein <laughs> in mm -hmm. restaurant. Um, but with Chick-fil-A, same thing. I mean, they have the highest average unit volumes out of anything. They're a yep. six day business, but I think it's because they stay so true to the brand and what yep. they're trying to promote better than anybody else. And they're able to deliver that day in, day out. When people tell me, oh, those numbers don't make sense. They're, they're XYZ is not even that good. See, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It's not about the product in and of itself, right? Obviously it has to taste good. Otherwise people right. aren't gonna buy it. But it's that overall feeling of like, what are, is the brand delivering on what they stand for? And do they do that day in, day out as consistent as possible? That's right. And I think, you know, the brands that do that will continue to win. Like the, yeah. it, it'll, it'll be there. Um, I had, a, I had a VP of ops and I remember like, he was like, hey, Solomon, we're right now in a very competitive landscape. There's gonna be a lot of knockoffs, mom and pops, chains. And I remember that like, he always said, he goes, for 16 handles, I really want it to be about that emotional connection, which I was like, yes, let's do that. How are we gonna do that? He's like, so that way when another Froyo shop opens up and because <laughs> it's like, what if 18 handles comes across <laughs> the street from us, right? Well, let the customer go, kick the tires, check it out, because new and shiny will get trial, right? right? You do get engagement and you, but let it be like a, a temporary conversion and have them come back to us. Cause then they'll realize if there's something, if there's a gap there and they're not getting that filled, right? And that's typically not just product, right? Mm -hmm. Then they'll come back to the source of, 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 of happiness, the source of truth, right? And, and I think if you build a brand that way, then that's the moat. That in and of great, itself is the moat. Great mode. philosophy. Yeah. No, love that. No, this was absolutely incredible. Um, a lot of takeaways, but um, if you had to pick one thing, uh, advice for any of the listeners and viewers to take back and implement in their business today, what would that one thing be? The one thing I would say is this, is if you are a D to C or a CPG brand, look at what the restaurants are doing. And if you're a restaurant brand, look at what D to C e-commerce and CPG brands are doing. There's something that can be learned. Take the best out of, out of that um, you know page and, and apply it to, to your business. Love that. Great. Yeah. Chew on that. Chew on that. That's awesome.